So, so for those of you just joining, um, what's radiation therapy? So radiation therapy uh, is a way to treat cancer. Um, and when I'm talking about radiation therapy, unlike Dr. Mankoff, I'm talking about beaming it in from the outside. So when you give MIBG or one of these uh, directed radionuclide therapies, you're putting something that's radioactive in the body and hoping that it'll localize to the tumor. In this case, what we're doing is we're t going from the outside in. So we try essentially to identify what we want to treat, what we don't want to treat, and it's all in our field about the sort of compromise between what you want and what you'll get. Why do we treat in this particular disease? We sort of have two general broad indications. We treat in a curative stance. In other words, I am treating everywhere in the body I believe the cancer currently exists and attempting to affect a cure of the disease. And we define cure fairly stringently, meaning you'll live the rest of your life to your natural life expectancy and it will never come back. Um, we do this in the post-operative setting when you've had the tumor removed but we worry about its chance to come back and we'll do this in the setting where the surgeon doesn't feel like they can safely operate. Um, we also radiate in a setting to provide relief of symptoms. So in this case, we're not trying to treat all the known disease. We're just going to treat the part that's bothering you and let the other therapies uh, have their chance at the whole picture. And that's where uh, Dr. Keefe, who will talk a little bit later, comes in. So what we currently have is this unprecedented ability to put dose where we want it in the body. And the real question that we now have to ask is, where is that going to make a difference? Where is our new technology going to add new benefits to the patient? Um, just briefly, the radiation plot process, as many of you know, we do a scan, and in this case, now in our modern era, we have CTs, we have four-dimensional scans where we can incorporate the motion of breathing. Um, we have PETs, we have MRs, we have specialized scans, and we can take all of these and put them together to get the best picture of exactly biologically what your tumor is doing as well as where it is in space and time, um, which increases the amount of work on my part where I then go through every single one of those studies and identify what I think is tumor and what I think is normal. And then I call the dosimeters and physicists the gardens, guardians of reality who remind me that there are laws of thermodynamics, not suggestions. Uh, so there are barriers of physical reality that I would love to be able to break that I simply can't. We, in this program, do a lot of other things that aren't done elsewhere. For example, we use a lot of the I-131 uh, MIBG scans or I-123 MIBG scans to localize the tumor a little bit better. So you can see in this case, there's a tumor hiding on that CT. It's a little hard to identify exactly what's what. And we can actually incorporate, incorporate that into our treatment plan. Um, and we frequently do that if a tumor takes up MIBG. So uh, the sort of standard bread and butter radiation therapy, you've got the table, you've got the accelerator, um, and it rotates around you. And to do that, when we use x-rays, we have a very fancy piece of equipment, although um, the wonderful thing about this is uh, there's many, many thousands of these very modern units all over the country and all over the world. Um, so when you're dealing with it, you may be using the technology in a new way, but you're using a fairly standard, well-established technology. Um, the state of the art of the sort of last century, as in, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, is something called intensely modulated radiotherapy. And to, to very briefly, what it allows you to do, instead of taking a normal x-ray beam, which would just create a very flat distribution, in this case, you have a patient, you know, you want to treat the tumor, but around the tumor are things like bowel, bladder, the rectum, uh, the bone marrow, and the pelvis itself. And in this case, you can actually identify all of those on the scans, and you can design a treatment plan that in the red is the highest dose radiation, green and blue are the lower doses, that focuses the radiation only in that one spot, and it does so in three dimensions. You can see how nicely you can get a conformal dose, but you also see on this the, the drawback of x-ray therapy, which is exit dose. No matter how fancy you get, the x-rays will go through, and you can see all this blue in the color wash 
is because there is exit dose. So there's a limitation physically to what you can achieve by going around. But looking at dose distribution, there's the tumor. That's the radiation. That's pretty good. Um, how do we get better? So we have trouble. This is a moving target, right? So you're breathing. Hopefully you're mostly staying still, but you're breathing, your heart's beating. There's things in your body moving that we'd like not to stop. So how do we get around that? Um, and one of the ways that we can do this, if I can get the movie to run. Hmm. Do we have a mouse? Can you mouse over and hit that, that play button? There you go. Is, is this so-called image-guided therapy. So this, in real time, gives us the ability, so this is an example of gating it to the respiration of the patient. We actually turn the beam on and off, depending on what part of the respiratory cycle you're in. Uh, it can get very sophisticated, and we can do this now fairly standardly. Um, we also have the ability to track tumors uh, optically. We can track them with radio frequency chips, where we actually put these uh, same thing that we use to, to uh, basically GPS chips that we can put into the tumor. We have all of these new things um, that we're dealing with now and sort of trying to find when is which technology the best. Um, a little word about technology. One of the problems in radiation right now is we have a branding issue. Uh, you'll hear these, you know, oh, gamma knife, cyber knife, tomotherapy, and um, like many things with vendors, every, each one of them is, of course, superior, and you must have only that. Uh, uh, the Astro Consensus uh, statement for our, our professional society, of which I belong and I'm on this committee, uh, came out with a statement that basically said they're all approximately equivalent. They're just different solutions to the same problem. I'll point out we have them all at Penn, um, and we will use whichever one is best, but most of the time you can get there uh, with x-rays either way. So. First question you get a lot. Uh, radiation doesn't work for these things, does it? So where's that from? This comes from an era where uh, the cardinal rule of radiation is if you can't see it, you can't treat it. You don't know where it is, you're not going to hit it, right? So in the old days, when we were using plain films to direct our x-rays, first of all, our technology was inferior. Second of all, we couldn't see the tumor. So where did we do well? We did well in lymphatics because we had lymphangiogram. We did well on bones because we had bony x-rays. So, so the word on the street was, oh, you can treat it when it's in lymphatics and bones, but nowhere else. That's obviously nonsense, right? So when you look at all these old trials, they suffer from everything else that's old. Um, outmoded technology, not knowing exactly what the tumor was, not knowing what dose to use, having a rare tumor. Uh, and this would rather be like a, avoiding surgery on account of the poor anesthesia results in the 1930s. So what ended up happening in the 90s and into the 2000s is we have these uh, paragangliomas of the carotid body in the head and neck area. And the surgery in these is very effective, but it's risky. There's big risks, and they're risks like leaking cerebrospinal fluid kind of risks. And so we began with some of these that weren't easily to be taken out. We started to radiate these. And lo and behold, we found two things. First of all, radiation is exceedingly effective. Over 85% of the time, the tumor will never grow again. Now you also see the problem. If you want it to shrink, it's not going to shrink. Um, and we've seen the same thing in our series for uh, the ones in the abdomen. Uh, you, occasionally you'll see things like this is a patient with one behind the orbit where the, the eye was bulging out and with radiation therapy it shrunk enough to handle. But most of the time what you'll see is things like this. Before radiation it's clearly grown and then for many, many years you'll continue to watch it. It will never shrink and the radiologist will tell you, well, you didn't have any effect. And I'll say, well, look at this. In this period of time it grew a lot and then it stopped growing forever. I think that's pretty good. I think that's clinically useful. Um, so then the question becomes, we have this new technology. We advertise it all the time on the radio and TV. We have protons. Uh, but actually, everyone has protons. You all have protons in you. Just we can accelerate them to a very fast speed, about 0.7 times the speed of light. So what is proton therapy, and what can it do? If you want two words to describe protons, they stop. Pure and simple. You saw the problem with the exit dose from the x-rays. Protons don't have exit dose. They stop. 
So it allows you the idealized situation we always show is this craniospinal radiation where you're trying to radiate the spinal column. And here you have x-rays with all this exit dose going to the critical organs in front. And with protons, there is no exit dose. And as quoted by Herman Suit from MGH, there is no dose of radiation like no dose of radiation. Um, and in this particular case, you can see protons shine. If you asked which one do you want, there's no one in this room who would say, I want this one. Um, we can get these dose distributions. So for example, this is actually IMRT. And you can see, again, the exit dose going all around. This is for a lung nodule. And you can see, again, no exit dose. What's the problem? First of all, they're not easy to deliver. You can see this is the cyclotron. If you remember when it got brought in, they had to decide structurally whether the South Street Bridge could handle the weight of this thing. And they brought it in in two halves on two giant flatbed trucks, like moving the space shuttle. Uh, you can see this is a long, down the back wall in our beam line. It's about a football field worth of, of electronics and magnets. The patient rooms that we treat on are these 30 meter gantries, um, uh, almost big enough to have their own gravitational field. And you can see here what the gantry looks like with people standing in front of it. So this is not a simple, straightforward, easy engineering feat to get these things to, to work to treat. Um, one of the other issues is anytime there's motion involved, we have issues. So if you want to know where they stop, you better know exactly what's in their way and exactly what it's going to do. Otherwise, and that to the extent that you don't know that, you'll degrade the ability to use the proton. Nevertheless, again, uh, you can see here, this is a tumor in the front of the mediastinum. You can see, again, the red dose. And you can see what the IMRT would have done. But there's another subtle thing here. Look at these little streaks through the lung. It's because the lung isn't a great backstop because it's a low density tissue. So you start running into these issues um, where we sort of have to come up with interesting or new uh, engineering and physical solutions. Um, and one of these is this uh, scanning beam that we have up and running now, and we'll have it on a gantry coming in January. Uh, with this, in, we'll actually hand place individual proton beamlets one by one into the tumor, and we'll have unprecedented precision with which to achieve. So you can see here, you're actually building that radiation field out of many little beamlets. And with this, you can see uh, what x-rays would do in terms of uh, dose distribution. And you can see here, you're able to really conform this and, and minimally have exit dose issues. Uh, but you can see down here, um, trying to treat the rind, you still have issues. So it, it, it solves a lot of problems, but it's not perfect. So what is our role? First of all, it's multidisciplinary care, and that's one of the things we have. We all come to the table. We all bring what we have to offer, and we try to figure out how to map it to what the patient actually needs. I think there's a limit to what technology has to offer. Um, it will not solve the laws of physics. It will not create things. Um, and so it's really these combinations of radiation therapy, using this technology to put dose where we couldn't put it before safely, and then asking, how does that help out all the other modalities? How does that help out? the patient to achieve their goal of additional lifespan, but with a good quality of life. And where are those? And the final sort of question we're dealing with is, we're now beginning to understand the molecular nature of these diseases. We understand the things that make them a cancer, or why they're bad, or why they're good. Here, we're actually simultaneously identifying what makes a cancer a cancer, as well as providing new targets for therapy intensification. So we can say, your tumor is going to behave badly, but look, I have this new drug, and look how it'll interact with the radiation, or I have this new target. So really, very quickly, is the last thing, what's on the horizon? Um, one of the other interesting things we're dealing with now is it turns out the immune system is probably responsible for most of our complications from acute inflammation from the radiation. But Look at what else the immune system can do. This is a, a New England Journal of Medicine paper on a patient with widely metastatic melanoma. They treated a lesion in the chest wall with radiation with a drug that affects the immune system. And if you look over time, um, all the other disease essentially disappeared. 
So we stimulated a massive systemic immune response that th this immune stimulating drug wasn't able to do by the combination of radiation with that. Um, one of the other unique things about our program is we use a lot of photodynamic therapy, which I refer to as non-ionizing radiation. In this case, you're using light with a sensitizer. And we have pretty good evidence this is from mesothelioma. Uh, here's a patient with a, a lesion that was treated. And you can see lesions that were, or a lesion that wasn't treated by this having a very strong immune response to immune therapy because we believe because of this PDT. Um, and this is an example of, of what you can do with a neuroendocrine type tumor by actually implanting a light source directly into the tumor. So these are things on the horizon. Um, and what sort of the big picture here is the immune system causes many of our complications in this field. Uh, it also can cause some of our greatest successes. And one of our challenges is to integrate uh, our current modes of therapy into the natural processes of the body. The body doesn't want this tumor. We just need to convince it of that and work sort of with the natural processes and against the tumor's biology to try to tilt this thing more and more in the patient's favor, more in favor of treating the tumor and, and more in favor of reducing the toxicity. And with that, I will stop for questions.